Hallelujah. Yeah, well, a big welcome to Matu River. It's lovely to see you all there. It's, it's always great. Yeah, hallelujah. Thank you for being here. Um, somebody turned 70 today. That, would that be you, Kathy? Tomorrow. <laughs> Too early. Sorry, you missed out. Moving on. <laughs> Kathy, why don't you stand up? Because I just want to bless you today. You've been such a... <laughs> You've been such a faithful person in this church and such a prayer warrior and a giver. And uh, so I know that you've been in this church forever, I think, pretty much. Were you, were you and Ruth the first, in the first intake in this joint? Ruth was, but Ruth's not here today and it is her birthday. Is Ruth here? She's out partying, party animal. And, and Justin as well, so it looks like it's a Crawford Bonanza. Justin as well, so happy birthday to you all. Um, we don't normally do uh, birthday calls. There's a reason for that, because you all have one. Like, seriously? But there are some significant birthdays, and I reckon 70 is pretty cool. And so next time you get recognised, Kathy, you'll be 100. <laughs> Amen. Well, I hope you have an awesome day. The Lord bless you. Is there anybody else whose birthday it is? Okay, we didn't miss anything or anyone. That's really, really good. Oh, Jesus, we give you praise. You are amazing. And for 2,000 years we've been singing your praises. Not just on Sunday morning, but all around the world, every day of the week, there's never been a moment when someone was not praising the King of Glory. It just is like that. Whether out loud or in your heart, uh, Jesus, we, uh, we adore you. We stagger at your compassion and your forgiveness and your generosity. We stagger at, at that. We stagger that you have sent the Holy Spirit to fill us and to move us and to change us in so many ways. And we just appreciate today. We pray your blessing on the word as it comes forth in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Uh, and by the way, tomorrow night, remember the prayer meeting we had at Suncorp this time last year and we took a couple of busloads in? Well, I just want you to know that it's on again tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Is that right, Jono? At 6 o'clock tomorrow night, and, but we're not running buses. You can just go in under your own steam, but that might be something you'd like to attend. Uh, I think they're going to be meeting outside Suncorp and uh, there's going to be a powerful powerful time there like last time oh the other thing I need to say is I'm actually on leave um, but I'm not easy to get rid of um, and uh, so if you don't see me at a lot of functions or prayer meetings and whatnot I'm, I'm, I'm on holidays right just or whatever for a season or two so I'll tell you when I'm back <laughs> amen is that cool um, praise God. All right. Well, there is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain that's filled with his great love. Come to the waters, there is a vast supply. There is a river that never will run dry. The scripture says that God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved. There is a, a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So even if you're not in the river, you can just be in a stream and you can enter into the gladness of the Lord from the overflow of the river. So just a little recap from last week. Because uh, I want to launch from there, from Luke chapter 4. Remember... I said that Jesus was in the synagogue and is declaring who he is and the evidence 
of who he is. And so he quotes from Isaiah 61. And he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted uh, and to proclaim uh, freedom to the captives, etc., etc. And he quotes from an Old Testament prophet, Isaiah, as he declares who he is. It was one of his most significant days in the synagogue. And everybody went, hee Ripper, the Messiah has come. Until somebody said, that's one of Joe's kids. <laughs> right? Remember? And Jesus reminds them that he's not just one of Joe's kids. That he's the son of the living God, that he is the anointed one. And he uses a story from the Old Testament to reinforce the fact that if you don't recognize when he's here, he'll just pass you by. So he talked to them about Elijah bypassing all the widows in Israel to go to a woman picking up sticks outside the boundary of Israel into a place called Zarephath. And he's pointing out that though she was outside the boundary of the religious system or outside the boundary of Israel and also that she was the most unlikely person for Elijah to go to in this drought because a widow is not going to be able to keep a hungry prophet. But all the other widows who thought they were entitled to the move of God, missed out because of pride. That's basically what Jesus is saying. Listen to last week's podcast. You'll get the drift. So let me go back there today because there was a sentence I didn't read to you last time in the reading. Now let's just go back there. Because he mentioned something else. I'm in Luke chapter 4. And after he finishes talking about the widow of the Zarephath, he says, he says, let me just read that, verse 25. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut up for a for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any one of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. This is a bit I didn't read. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, that's Elijah's descendant. There were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So he not only speaks pretty straight about the widow of Zarephath, he slips in another story that would also have been familiar to them. They knew these stories. They knew the Old Testament. They're in the synagogue. They are very familiar with all the writings and everything that happened and the history of the whole place. And so Jesus reminds them. So here's two great prophets, Elijah and Elisha, that had passed throughout the country and bypassed all the religious ones in their pride because they did not recognize who was in their midst. Boom. Because they said he's just one of us, and he says... Actually, I'm not just one of you. I am the anointed one. And for that, they tried to push him over a cliff. Remember? That was last week. Well, turn with me to find out about this other story of Naaman that Jesus referred to in that same passage, and you'll find it in 2 Kings. And we don't have time to go into that whole story today. I might save it for another time. <laughs> but there's a couple of things that might help us to recognize 
the presence of Jesus, the anointed one and the Holy Spirit and be able to receive the impartation from the word and the spirit. Are you with me? So I'm in 2 Kings chapter 5 and you probably heard this story in Sunday school. Who knows the story of Naaman the leper? Okay, three, four, that's good. Very literate we are. Naaman the leper. Isn't it chronic? You know, it's like when we get to heaven, I hope they have surnames. Otherwise, we're going to have the woman with the issue for all eternity. <laughs> we're going to have Naaman the leper. You know, like, anyway. <clears throat> so Naaman, he's a Syrian. So he comes from outside of the border again of Israel. And he happens to be the chief sitting bull of the armies of Aram. But he's a leper, so it's not looking good. And he hears through a little girl who had been taken captive in a war, brought back to Syria, and he hears through her that there is a prophet in Israel and that in Israel you can get your leprosy cleansed. Pretty good. So he goes to the king and the king gives him official letters to the king of Israel. So the king of Aram is writing to the king of Israel, giving him official letters saying, just heal my commander in chief of my armies. Thank you very much. Amen. And I'm on verse 7 of chapter 5, if anybody's following. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? No, mate, you're not. Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a fight with me. So it, there's an international incident here, guys. This is, this is headlines, you know. Probably not in the courier, but it's headlines, you know. Jesus. Where do we get to? <laughs> when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent this message, because tearing your robes is pretty, you know, it's the last resort. It's like pulling your hair out. <laughs> it's right up there with that, apparently. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's, Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourselves, yourself seven times in the Jordan and you will, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. And he says, I'm not going to the Jordan. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And so he turned away and went off in a rage. Let's just stop there. We might get further, but I don't know. Are not the rivers of Abana and Farpa far better than the river of Jordan in Israel? Remember, Jesus is saying this to the people in the synagogue. For all we know, he may have actually told them the whole story to refresh their memory. But in any case, they would have known. Well, listen up, Naaman. Got news for you. Any old flippin' river won't do. That's the bottom line. There is a river that flows from God above. 
There is a fountain that's filled with God's great love. Come to the waters, there is a vast supply. See, for Naaman, what he doesn't understand is that the source of this river is deep and the source of this river is actually Jesus. And sometimes your belief system can cost you your healing. And it's not having to go at anybody who hasn't got healed over something because I'm looking for some myself. But I'm just saying. So Abana and Fapa, these rivers I could go to, but I'm not going to the Jordan. Thank you very much. But Naaman went away angry and I thought, he said, that he would surely come out to me and call on the name of the Lord his God. And Naaman's servant said to him, My father, if the prophets had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself into the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became like that of a young boy. going to have a look at these rivers because when I looked them up Abana means a golden stream it looks good it's really a pretty river, very attractive and Fapa, sounds like a racehorse, we used to have one of them <laughs> Fapa was swift and significant and these rivers looked a whole lot better than the Jordan River any day of the week, you see. This is in response to them not recognising Jesus. And apart from the fact that they're better, the Jordan is kind of muddy, and I'm not sure about the seven times. Seven times? Couldn't it just be a quick flick, dip? thing you know let me tell you a little bit about the Jordan because you need to know which river you're in because <laughs> there's a lot of people in churches just in a river that's looking good I'm not criticizing other churches I'm criticizing a mindset okay hey the Jordan River on earth represents the river of God The Jordan River actually gives us understanding of the spiritual river of God that flows from the throne of God. First the natural and then the spiritual. So God shows us something in the natural so that we can conceive and perceive the things that he's saying in the spirit. Are you with me? The Jordan River is mentioned 100 times in the Old Testament and 80 times in the New Testament. I didn't count them, I read it. And the Jordan starts in the fountain of the deep. It's a spring-fed river. Starts in the fountains of the deep. The word Jordan means to flow down or to descend. I'm talking about the river. I don't know what your name means, Jordan. Jordan, Jordan. Hopefully it means to flow down. Because it always flows to the lowest point on earth. Water finds its way to the lowest place and so does the anointing. The river is like the anointing of God. Humility attracts the anointing because it flows to the lowest place. And the, the Jordan is the life-giving river for the people of God. Okay. So you wanted to know all that. When Jesus said, come to the waters, there's a vast supply, he was speaking of a spiritual river. So let's have a look at the representation on earth. Are you with me? First of all, the Jordan River is a place of separation. Not only does it separate the wilderness from the promised land, long before 
It separated the wilderness from the promised land. It was a place of separation because Abraham and Lot parted ways. And Lot went one way and Abraham the other and the dividing wall between them was the Jordan River. It's a place where you get separated from where you were. It's a place that separates you from death to life, from sin to holiness. Our past identity gets separated when we come to Christ. It's a place of conversion. So you need to know you're in the right river. I'm not talking about the Jordan River. It's about coming to the Lord. Oh, because this is what he was talking about when he was communicating in the synagogue. Now, we don't, when, when, when we read the New Testament, we don't have the background of the Old Testament like, like the, the, the Israeli people do. Even to this day, they know their stories. We don't. And so we just get the light fluff on the top going along. But as Jesus spoke these words, like he, he's, they are being cut <laughs> over their own history. They're being like blown away as Jesus tells these two stories and they're realizing that he's actually telling them that they're going to miss out on the Messiah. No wonder they want to push him over a cliff because this is what he's actually sharing with them. Stay with me. You see, the look good golden stream of the Abana He's not going to cut it for us. You need to actually personally experience the river of God. You need to personally be in the flow. Because uh, let me just say, I, I, I actually fear that some of, her, of us have just embraced a church culture, the culture of the church but not the person of Christ. That might annoy you a bit because we're in the synagogue. Maybe it's more important to you to look good than be real. I'm just saying, we're all guilty of these things. But the crunch time comes, is, is the move of God going to pass you by or are you going to be in? Uh, and it concerns me that sometimes we can sing the songs and we can get into the culture as they did in the synagogue and, and everything else, but we're never actually separated from the world. We never actually came to that place of conversion, that place of separation. It just became a convenient culture and it suits us because we're good people and we like it. And that's good. But you need Christ. <laughs> There's no other name under heaven you need to know the person of Jesus Christ as your saviour who has separated you from your past life, who has separated you from your sin and you've entered into the promised land, you know. So it's not just a place of separation, it's a place of miracles. It's a place, of Jordan is chock-a-block full of miracles. The unexpected happens. Even the impossible happens. It's, a, it's an amazing place. 2 Kings chapter 6, right the next page. The prophets all want to build a bigger house. And they went down to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water Oh, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. Hey, never borrow the anointing. The man of God uh, asked, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it in there and made the iron axe head float. Lift it out, he said, and the man reached out his hand and took it. <sighs> now for my next trick. You see, sometimes we dumb God down. 
because of our past disappointments of what didn't happen and so we lower our expectation and we dumb him down you know and and, and we just want him to stay safe but the bible is actually full of miracles from genesis to the book of maps genuine miracles even the book even 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 the cover on my bible is genuine leather they're for real folks you know and and sometimes we can shrink back and we, our expectations are lowered. If your expectations have lowered over the miraculous in Christ, um, I suggest that we go to the place of our hurt because when we dismantle the wound on the inside, the enemy has to depart. And we're often wounded over and disappointed over what didn't happen and the miracle that we prayed for did not come to pass. And so now to accommodate that emotionally, we must drop down our expectations of the miraculous of God. Guilty as charged, Your Honour. But we, we have to find our way beyond this Otherwise, we will have a very dumbed down average God who can't perform miracles because he's incompetent and impotent. Just saying. The Jordan has miracles in it. It has powerful miracles in it. I've just named one for the sake of time because I've got some other stuff to do today. It's a place of wrestling. It's okay to wrestle with God. It's okay not to understand everything. It's okay when things go wrong and you're saying, God, I don't get it. He's not going to fall off the throne. The wrestling is good. That's one of the things that happened at the Jordan. Jacob wrestled with God in one of the small streams off the Jordan, at the, at the Jabbok Causeway. Jacob is wrestling with God. This is the Jordan, folks. All this stuff is in the Jordan because God's wanting us to know how the flow of the river of the spirit of life is. And it's not all peaches and creams, and sometimes we have to wrestle through because Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm not letting you go until you bless me. That's a really good prayer. That's a really good prayer. God, no, I'm not shifting. Uh, no. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And he walked with a limp because he realized who he was and who God was and in the wrestling... That was the blessing that came out of it. Sometimes we don't know who we are, and if we don't know who we are, we'll never find who God is to us. But in the wrestling through of the staff, and go, God, God, if I was God, I would do better than that. Now, I know you don't talk to God like that. And so I have to remind myself of such verses as can the clay say to the potter, why hast thou made me thus? Because sometimes I just go, God, I don't get that. I don't get that. <laughs> and there's a wrestling. And there's a wrestling because in the wrestling there's who are you? And Jacob's saying, who are you? And God's going, you'll never know, mate until you find out who you are. I'll tell you who you are. You're Israel. You're Israel. No longer Jacob. Identity changes in the Jordan River. In the wrestling and the disappointment, there's a change that comes over you. Don't let the change be one of continuing disappointment and dumbing down God because he couldn't come up with the goods the first time. You don't know the full purposes of God. Let's stand strong and say, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Laying aside the things, those things. The wrestling. Anybody wrestled with God recently? Who's wrestled with God recently? Did you win? (laughs) 
Guys, it's about it's a place, the Jordan River. It's a place of the baptism or the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The look good river of the Farpa and the Abana, the look good river, they don't, it, it, it cannot provide the baptism of the Holy Spirit because sometimes the baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't look good. Sometimes he's overwhelming us. Sometimes our flesh just can't, can't cope. Sometimes we're blah, 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 blah. As we, as we stumble through speaking in tongues, it doesn't always look good. But it happens in the Jordan. It doesn't happen in any other river. Any old river won't do you. It was at the Jordan where Jesus was baptised by John and a dove representing the Holy Spirit came and rested on him. That was the Jordan, guys. And it was at the Jordan where Jesus launches his ministry. It's not about a physical river. It's about the flow of God by the Holy Spirit because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Just keep pulling us back here because I'm wanting to keep reminding us that this was in the synagogue. So the last one... I have for you today. There's many other place things that we could say about the Jordan, but the last one is that it's a it's a place of impartation. It's a place of impartation. Turn to your neighbour and say, "The Jordan is a place of impartation." It's a place of the double anointing. I don't understand how impartation works. I just know it does. And Paul writes to Timothy and talks about impartation. He also writes to Rome and says that he wants to impart a gift to them. There are impartations that take place from spirit to spirit when you're in the flow of the Jordan River. So I'm in 2 Kings. You know, people say, well, well, what about the New Testament? Well, I'm talking about what happened in the New Testament, the stories that Jesus told. Because we, we can't actually draw from the New Testament unless we know the old. Because the old is in the new revealed. And the new is in the old concealed. So you actually have to find what's in the old to get the fullness of the new. Are you with me? Everyone's really serious today. I, I, I actually don't have any jokes today. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're going to have a look at the impartation. Even though I don't understand how it works there's an impartation of the anointing i feel it the, the anointing is actually tangible it's it's actually tangible you can feel it jesus did when when the crowd was pressing around him and a woman came and touched the hem of his garment and and he said who touched me and Peter says, for crying out loud, everybody. But Jesus said, no, no, for virtue or power has been released from me. There's a feelability, a tangibility about the anointings of God. Whew. It seems to me and this is about the Jordan, the flow of God. It seems to me that the anointing can be stored up over many years through prayer, speaking in tongues, the word of God. There's a storing up. It's like a battery can store up power. And then it can break yokes. 
the anointing in the Jordan, the anointing that Jesus was talking about, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. It's a heavenly substance. Come on, guys. You're touching heaven. You're touching the stream of God when you get in the flow of the anointing. It's a heavenly substance. It's substance. That's why you fall over. You should learn to hold your liquor. It's a heavenly... It's a spiritual materiality. It's a spiritual material. That's why uh, Paul and Peter, whoever it was, one of them, Paul, prayed over handkerchiefs and aprons and sent them out to heal the sick because there's something of a spirit, materiality, of the anointing that's tangible and can work. But let's dumb that down. If we're in the Farpa River... Because it doesn't look good. It looks stupid. Often. Let's face it. It just looks dumb. <laughs> but we're not after the golden stream of looking good. We're after the flow of the Spirit of God. See. So let me land on somewhere i'm in second kings chapter two i'm jumping all over but but if the jordan river is mentioned a hundred times you're going to expect there's going to be a bit of jumping right with the kangaroo loop and so the background of this story this part of it about the impartation is elijah the old bloke is about to be taken to heaven and Elisha is wanting what's on him. And so they go through many places. They go to Gilgal at the Jordan, <laughs> a place of conversion. They go to Bethel, the house of bread. They go to Jericho where the walls fell down. And then at the Jordan, something's going to happen. Because all the way... The young fella, Elisha, was saying, um, uh, sorry, the old guy was saying to Elisha, you stay here because I'm pressing on to Bethel. I'm pressing on to Jericho. I'm pressing on. And all the while, Elisha is saying, not without me, you're not. Not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. I'm coming, you're going, that's it. And so together, they kept on walking and when they had crossed, I'll back up so that you know that it's the Jordan River. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. And Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water with it, and the water divided into the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So all this is at the Jordan. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Well, who? Wish I'd been there. <sighs> and Elisha says, let me have a double portion. Let me have a double portion of your spirit. Your spirit. Interesting. Well, Elijah said, you've asked a pretty difficult thing. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. If you see me when I'm taken, it's a place of supernatural vision, you know. And as they walked, this is one of my favourite scriptures. I just get in here. I almost go up with them. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Think about it. We read it and just go, nah, 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 nah. think about that. A chariot of fire and horses. A chariot of fire? Okay. But horses of fire? Uh, 
appeared and separated the two of them and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. He didn't go in a chariot. The chariot separated the two of them at the Jordan because I tell you what, Elisha's hanging on to his cloak. He ain't letting him go because he said, if you see me, he's like, I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. I'm not letting you out of my sight. So they're so close that had the whirlwind come, they would have both gone up and then there would have been no prophetic word on the earth at the time. And so God has to send angels, horses and chariots of fire. All angels don't look like they got feathers and a crown. So the chariots of God come and separate them and then, thank God, only Elijah went up. In a whirlwind. And Elisha sees this. This is all at the Jordan. This is all in the flow. This doesn't happen at the Farpa or the Abana. This happens at the Jordan. Elisha saw this and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. I haven't got a clue what that means, but that seems to be what they always said on the way through the Old Testament. My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more, and then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. And he picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he went back and he stood on the bank of the Jordan and he took that cloak that had fallen uh, from him and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left and they crossed over. These are foretastes of what to expect in the river of God. These are foretastes. These are the things that are in the river. This is why we value this river, even though it's a bit like the Brisbane River and it gets a pretty muddy, it's different from the other rivers because it's representative of the flow of God's anointing to his people on the earth. The Jordan is a place of supernatural vision. We see beyond the veil. We see past the normal. It's a place of the double portion. It's a place where we tear our old garments that once identified us and we pick up a mantle for the future and the rest of our life. What, what river do you, do you want to be in? Now remember, this is the story that Jesus is telling them. How much of that story he told, we don't know because the writers just give us that main headlines in the New Testament. But I want to just say to you, I think, I think it's time for us to understand and to seek after. To seek after some of the stuff that's, that God has provided for us that's in the flow of the river, that's in the anointing. And if you want to go to a nice, pretty church that goes for 20 minutes and then 10 minutes and then you can go, that probably looks good to you, but I'm not interested in that. I'm looking for where the anointing's flowing. I'm looking for where the presence is. I'm looking for the Jordan River. Because at the end of the day in the Jordan, there's a mantle. There's a mantle. I was in Fiji. I'm going to finish with this. It's time. You can have an early mark today. I was in Fiji some years ago and I um, was at a conference there with Pastor Suliasi, whom some of you know. And uh, Reinhard Bonke was there. You've got to be happy with that, you know. Reinhard, if you don't know him, was a... Uh, a major evangelist bringing millions to Christ in, in Africa. So I was in the room when Dave and I were, when 
Reinhardt told us this story. And I've seen it since replayed in other places, so you can look it up for yourself. But it was wonderful to be there and hear it personally from him. And, and he told us of an encounter that he had, not at the Jordan River, but in the stream of God. Let's go back to the 19, 1900s. There, were, there was a man and his brother who were born in the early 1900s. Their names were George and Stephen Jeffries. And I'm just going to put Stephen off to the side, not because he didn't cut it, but just want to concentrate on George because that's what the story was about. He, he had a massive healing ministry, planted hundreds of churches, and all but two of them are still going. <laughs> That's pretty good. He, he moved powerfully in the things that we talked about today. But he got old. Funny that. And he laid aside the ministry and just re went into retirement. Don't count to chickens, I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> but one day, Reinhard Bonnke, and I've told some of you this story before, that's why I questioned whether or not to say it again, but here it is. One time, Reinhard Bonnke, when he had finished his Bible school training in preparation to be a missionary in Africa, he decided he would just take a bus tour for the last couple of days because he'd finished school and his, his transport back to Germany uh, was not, had a couple of days to go. So he just caught buses and just decided to have a look around London. He got off the bus and just walked down a lane. And he saw on the letterbox the name... G. Jeffries. Now, he had heard about the great revival that had happened in the early 1900s and that George and Stephen um, Jeffries were the prime movers and they actually uh, probably were the greatest evangelists since John Wesley's time. And so he looked and he thought, I wonder if it's possible that he once lived here. So he went and knocked on the door and as he tells it, a very large woman filled the frame of the door. And he asked, did George Jeffries live here? And she said, yes. And he said, does he still live here? And she said, yes. And he said, can I come in? And she said, no. You cannot come in. And as Reinhardt tells it, he says there was no way to get in. <laughs> Wish I could do his accent. As she's saying, no, you cannot come in, a voice from inside yelled out, let him come in. So she stepped aside and he walked in. And he wanted to introduce himself and say what great things he was going to do. And you know how you are if you're young and you're standing in the midst of someone who's great. You know, and pick me, you know. He said, George Jeffries did not say a word. Not one word. But he said he fell on his knees and he grabbed me down with him. And we're on our knees together. And he began to bless and he began to pour out the anointing. And he began to pour out the miraculous. He began to pour out the things that I've been talking to you about that are in the river of God that he had moved in himself. And he pours it all out over Reinhardt Bonnke. And Reinhardt said he could hardly get up. And when he finished, he left. Reinhardt gets up, walks out the door, and he said, I knew, I knew that that day I had received a mantle. 
I knew that that day I had had an impartation from George Jeffries, one of the greatest revivalists ever. He says, I knew that I had that. Then he said, the next day he arrived home in Germany and his father met him at the train station. And his father said to him, after a polite greeting, as I think Germans do pretty well, his father said to him, have you heard the news, son, about George Jeffries? And before Reinhardt could say, oh, I met with him yesterday, his father said, he passed away last night. There was a moment. <laughs> there was a moment. It was not in the Fapa. It was not in the Albana. Any old river won't do, folks. You've got to be where the flow is. And you've got to be hungry for the flow. And you've got to long for it. And you've got to wait for it. And when you grow cold like I sometimes do and get sick of waiting and uh, just go, Psh. there's a pull. There's a pull. Back to the Jordan. Back to the place of the anointing. Back to the place of the impartation. Back to where God's spirit moves. And I believe God's pulling us back there. Now, we don't have Reinhardt Monkey here today. You just got me and a couple of others. But I tell you what, the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is. And these are the things that Jesus said in the synagogue. He was pointing them to the reality, pointing them to the longing, sh shifting them out of their mindset of, is this bloke cut it or does he look good enough? Does he look like he might be the Messiah. Hmm, he doesn't look much like the far par. So Jesus takes him all the way down the Jordan. All the way down the Jordan. And he tells them these stories. Shakaba. Kilama stelebe. Iramahande nemo namasi delebo shakaba hasutu brandi nirishte. Ki tu yasa talabasi delive. 